you found Mark chapter number 12, go ahead and stand to your feet and we'll honor the reading of God's Word together. The Bible says, And one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, and perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, Which is the first commandment of all? And Jesus answered him, The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like, namely this, Thou shalt love thy, what? Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said unto him, Well, Master, thou hast said the truth, for there is one God, and there is none other but He, and to love Him with all the heart, and with all the understanding, and with all the soul, and with all the strength, is to love his, love his neighbor as himself, and more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he had answered discreetly, he said unto him, Thou art not far from the kingdom of God. And no man after that durst ask him any more question. Father, it is good to be here this morning. Lord, I'm thrilled at the opportunity to minister to such a great crowd of people this morning. I have to take a minute and realize, Lord, that I'm unworthy to stand. Father, I thank you for the blood of Jesus that cleanses us from all iniquity. And God, I thank you that even as I stand before your people this morning, God, I have some great news to share with them because you've given me a message. And I pray that you would help me to deliver the message not in my power, not in my words, but you would just overcome any inability that I have and speak through me. Lord, loosen my stammering tongue this morning that I may speak your word. And God, as I'm obedient to your word, I believe that you speak to the heart of every hearer. So those in the room, those that are listening on the radio, CD ministry, internet, whatever the means may be today, God, I pray that those under the sound of my voice would hear you and not me. Father, there's people listening today that are mourning the loss of a loved one. Father, we've lost one of our own church family this week. We pray for that family and others that you'd help them. God, we thank you for the faithfulness of Brother Fred. We pray that his memory would live on. We know that it will. God, we pray for these others that are sick. There are many on our prayer list. There are some that are facing testing and uncertainty. But God, you know the outcome. And I pray we'd take comfort in the Scriptures, knowing that all things work to our good. Lord, we love you. We are the call according to your purpose. So, as the Scripture says, I know that everything is working together for our good. So help us to take comfort in that this morning. God, I pray today, if there's one lost, that you'd save them in our midst. If there's one discouraged, that you'd provide the encouragement they need. Father, I pray that you'd help me today to build up, uh, Lord, these believers in your sight. I pray that the Holy Spirit would work amongst us today and we'll be careful, Lord, help us to be careful, to thank you and praise you for that which you've done and that which we expect you to do. In Jesus' precious name we pray and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated this morning. <clears throat> We've been going through a sermon series entitled Triumphing in the Tempter's Time. Triumphing in the Tempter's Time. Now, uh, we know that the time that we live in is really the devil's age, right? The Bible says 
the God of this world. That literally means the God of this age or the God of this time with a little g. Now I want to remind you that God the Father is still on the throne, that Christ is there uh, at His right hand even now, but the God of this age is very powerful. We, we're in a spiritual war today. That's what the Bible teaches us. And we have to, uh, we have to put on the armor of God and we have to arm ourselves. The Bible says that we take the Spirit. We know uh, the sword of the Spirit. That's the Word of God. So we need the Word of God. If we're to fight this battle, then we must get ourselves educated. We've got to have our weaponry ready at any time. There are so many today that could not possibly fight, let alone win the battle because they don't know the Word of God. So you have to learn the Word of God, right? We study the Word of God. But today, I want to preach to you just a little bit on this idea. We've got to learn to love. If we're to make it through this time, I want to share with you that that Satan wants to separate us. Did you know that? He wants to drive a wedge between Christians. God wants us to dwell together in unity, but Satan wants to drive a wedge between us. We know that he wants to get in the family. We see that time and time again. He wants to put husband at odds with wives, and if he can't seem to do that, well, he'll use the children. If there's any way that he's can't that he can, he'll try to get a toehold in your family somewhere. And I want to tell you, friend, even if he's not able like that, he'll try everything that he can do. He'll try to get a toehold in the church. He'll try to get to your Sunday school teacher. He'll try to stir up some strife in the church to discourage you and derail you from doing any work for the Lord. He's very active today. And we need to learn about that. We need to study that. We need to be aware of that. And we need to be unified together, moving forward, refusing to give place to the devil. We need to refuse to give place to the devil this morning. Now, important as we think about moving forward in this time is having this love in our heart. Having this love in our heart. And God, God willing, we're going to preach twice today, once this morning about love for the Father and then once tonight about love for our neighbor. The two are very closely akin. The two are outlined right here in our text and we're going to talk about that at length for a short while this morning. Now when we look back at what the Bible says there in verse number 29 well let me give you a little background first we know uh, that the religious leaders, the scribes, the the Pharisees, uh, we know that the Sadducees, the only one thing that they seemed to have in common was wanting to get rid of Jesus. They knew that Jesus was not good for their business. They they wanted to get shed of Jesus just as quickly as possible. And they kept having meetings. They kept trying to determine how they might possibly discredit Jesus, how they may possibly get rid of him. But the truth is, Jesus was pretty popular at this time. The folks knew that at least Jesus was a great prophet. And, and if they had tried to get rid of him at this time, they would have gone against the will of the people. And it would have been almost impossible to do. So they were trying to discredit Jesus in the eyes of the people. That's what they were doing. Trying to trap him in his words. If you back up to the first few verses of this chapter, we know that Jesus gave a a parable. That's an earthly story with a heavenly meaning and and he's talking about uh, he's talking about a vineyard and and how that uh, the vineyard was let out to husbandmen and how, how the husbandmen didn't really do their job and, and we know uh, that he's really making reference to the Jews and, and he's talking about them in a roundabout way which incited their anger. They they wanted to get rid of Jesus so they go on and they try to trap him in his words. Verse 13 of chapter number 12 says and they sent unto him certain of the Pharisees and the Herodians to what? Catch him in his words. To trap him. To trick him up. To trip him up in 
these words. That's what they want to do. Discredit Jesus. And they ask him about taxes. Well, should we pay tribute to Caesar or should we not? And Jesus gave them a very wise answer. He said, render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and, and, and the things that are God, uh, God's to God. So he answered them very wisely. They couldn't seem to catch him in anything. They couldn't seem to trip him up in anything. So they keep on going. Now it's the Sadducees' turn. If you go to verse number 18 and read down a few verses there, well, they try to trip him up in the resurrection. They asked him questions about the resurrection and, and Jesus essentially says to them, you, you do err not knowing the Scripture. He said, in the resurrection, they're, they're not given in marriage. They're, there's no marriage there. You don't know what you're talking about. So again, they didn't catch him up in his word. So now you've got these two groups that's already trying to catch him and now they get together again, try to find another way that they might catch him. So this scribe comes. Now, a scribe is a law. You know, and we're not a, not a lawyer in the sense that we think of, but a scribe is one that knows the law, the law of Moses. Now, if I'm not mistaken, uh, the the Jews had taken the law and they had made about 613 different laws that had to be kept, and they were very meticulous about keeping this law. And some laws were more important than others. Now, he's trying to catch Jesus up, trying to trap him here by asking him, "What is the?" most important. He, he, he's not saying what is the, I know the Bible says here in verse number uh, uh, 29 or verse number 28, he says, he says, which is the first commandment of all? What he's talking about is not in consecutive or order, but he say, he's saying, what is the most important law of all? That's the question that the scribe is asking to Jesus. Now, you find that Jesus goes to the very heart of what he said, and, and I want to share with you first. I've got two points for you this morning and Lord willing I'll have two more for you tonight. I want to share with you first the object of our love. Jesus shares with him verse number 29 and Jesus answered him the first of all commandments. He's saying the most, the, the greatest of all commandments, he said, is, is here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. So what he's saying, uh, essentially if you boil that down, he says Jehovah Elohim is Jehovah. So he, he's, saying that, he's saying that Jehovah Elohim is Jehovah. So he, he, now Elohim uh, or Jehovah is a singular form of God. That's a singular form of addressing God or a, a name for God in a singular form. Now, uh, we know that Elohim, it's a plural form, right? We understand that. So he's saying, what he's saying there is kind of twofold thing. It, you see the plurality of the being of God. First, you see uh, the object of our love is the Lord. The object of our love is the Lord. He is who we are to love. That's what Jesus is saying. He is the very object of our love. Now, we have to understand his plurality. Many people don't understand this today. Uh, they say, well, preacher, how in the world uh, can God the Father be the Father? How can God the Son uh, be, be God? And, and how can the Holy Spirit be God? And still, there only be one God. Many people trip up on that. Many people today say, well, I just don't, is Jesus God? Is Jesus really God? Let me answer that uh, by saying unequivocally, Jesus is God. Jesus is God. That's what this scripture is saying. He, he, he's using a poor form in Elohim. We know if we go back to Genesis chapter number one, if you want to flip back with me right there, that's the same usage Back there in chapter number one, it says this, in the beginning, God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, Elohim, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit created everything. Friends, Jesus was right there at the beginning. At the beginning of creation, the Holy Spirit was there. The Bible says the Spirit moved on the waters. But the Bible says that God the Holy Ghost, God the, uh, God the Son, and God the Father were all there in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth go back and read that whole chapter and you'll find at the end it says that God saw that it was good God knew that his creation
creation was good. So there was no sin therein until Adam and Eve sinned in the garden. So the, the, the Lord is the object of our love. You see, he, he, you see one side of his nature. He exists or, or manifests himself in three different ways. He appears as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, we think about that in three different ways. Most of the time, we attribute, we think about the Father in terms of creation. And that's a good way to think about it. The Father created everything, but like I said, Jesus and the Holy Spirit were there as well. We think about Jesus being associated with redemption, right? We think about Jesus accomplishing our redemption on Calvary's cross, and that's very much true. Uh, uh, First Peter says, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your own vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of who? Jesus Christ. With the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish, without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times of you. So before the foundation of the world, it was God's plan for God to come to earth, for God in the form of Jesus to make a way that his blood would cleanse me from all iniquity. How about that? You, you see, uh, God the Father, God the Son, we think about God the Spirit, and we think about his role. We know what Jesus said about him in John chapter number 16. Uh, Jesus said, when he has come, he'll reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment of sin because they believe not on me, of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more, of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. We think about the Holy Spirit bringing conviction to our heart. And rightly so, but the Holy Spirit is God. He is God, bringing conviction to my heart. He's, he's made a way. He's created me. He's made a, a, a way of redemption for me. And he even drew himself or even drew me to him. That's what Jesus said in John 6, verse 44. No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him, and I will raise him up that last day. So the Holy Spirit draws us. Uh, the, the, God the Father created us. God the Son, he made a way of redemption for us, and the Holy Spirit draws us, and now he guides us when he's in our heart, but they're all God. They're all one. You see, there's one true God, Elohim. He said, Jehovah, Elohim is God, he is Jehovah, right? That's what we're saying. The object of our love is the Lord. The object of our love, we should love the Lord God. We should love the Lord God. Now, he said also there in verse number 28, the first of all commandments, the greatest of all these commandments, he said, is here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. We'll get into that in a minute, but love the Lord. We've established who the Lord is, right? We know who He is, but is He your God? He said, love the Lord thy God. It, uh, the, you see, God has a preeminent position in the life of a believer. Every believer ought to have God at his head. Yeah, God ought to be the head of every home. He ought to be the head of every church. He ought to occupy the preeminent spot in the lives of every Christian. Love the Lord thy God. Now listen, there are many folks today that have a God who is not the Lord. There are many folks today that worship things besides the Lord. And you say, and I look around this room, and I bet you there's not a soul in here that would get down before a carved image, whether wood or stone or something made of hand and, and would worship it as a God. But I bet if I went all over this room, there are folks in here that's put something ahead of God in their life. And probably every one of us know that to be true, that at some time we have put something else in the preeminent position in our lives, whether it was a job, making money for our family, whether it was a, a, a house or a car or 
or, or a boat or maybe even a relationship with somebody. Maybe even been a child that you placed. See, Abraham had trouble with that. With Isaac. You see, God called him to give his only son, Isaac. And we know that he was willing to sacrifice him. And anything you put in the place of God becomes your God. It could be anything. It could be music. could be football. could be a NASCAR race. Anything that's more important than God becomes your God. You see, that's what he's saying. The object of our love is is Jehovah, the Lord, the Lord thy God. It's Him that we serve. We have to make the decision just like Joshua did. The Bible says in Joshua 24, And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. How about you? Have you said that? As for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. Men, have you done that with your, with your children? Have you, have you said that in their presence, in your wife's uh, uh, presence? Do they know that you're going to put God first? If you're putting God first, that means on payday, guess who gets the first check? Guess where? The tithe goes out first. That means on Sunday, that means you live in my house, you're going to church. You ain't deathly ill, and it ain't a major snowstorm, you're going to church. And, and, and that's not something to be debated. We need to, men, we need to lead our families. We need to love the Lord. Listen, we need to set the example. We talked to them about that last week. Men, setting the example, leading our families. We don't need to depend on our wives to do that. Not that they can't do it, but we need to set the example. We need to get everybody up and say, come on, it's time to go to church. Don't make your wife drag you out of church. Don't make her belittle you into going to church. Don't even make her beg her to sit down write the check you get it out you write the tile down you be ready to go you say you be the one to say on Wednesday night we got to hurry up we got to get to a one we got to hurry up this evening we got reality checkpoint practice we got to be there we love the Lord God and he's a God of this house you see that's what he's talking you'll never triumph you'll never have victory in this life if you're a Christian and you're not putting God first. You see, that, that love, that means to unconditionally love. That's the kind of love, that's not a... There are several words in the Greek language for, for love, but this word is agape. You know, that's the highest form. And that's a love that's chosen. You choose to love God. God chose to love you. You see, God chose to love you before you ever loved Him. And God gives you an opportunity to choose to love Him. He don't make you. I've often wondered about that. Well, if all these things were so important, why didn't God make me do that? God don't want robots. Do you want your children to love you because you told them to? No. You want your children to love you because they choose to. To love you. It's, a, it's an unconditional love, all right, but it's a chosen love. Now he said there in verse 30, we'll uh, get through this in a hurry, but four things I want to show you from verse number 30. He said, And thou shalt, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with what? All thy heart. He said, All thy heart. What is the heart? Well, it's the source of our thoughts, right? It's the source of our words, according to the, the text, according to the Bible. It's the source of our thoughts, our words, and really our actions, right? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speak. You know, most times, if you, if you show me a man who, who makes it a habit to, to, to speak profanely, I'll show you a man that don't know Jesus as his Savior. I'll show you a man that's not very close to the Lord. Or he'd change his talking. He, 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 it would change his actions. 
You, you see, it's where your heart, where everything begins. We know the heart is deceitful. That's why the heart has to be surrendered unto God. It has to be surrendered unto the Lord Jesus Christ. You, you see, uh, there, there can be no divided law to you. Jesus said, you can't serve God and mammon. Jo- Joshua said, choose you this day whom you will serve. You've got to choose to serve the Lord or you choose to go your own way. One or the other, love the Lord thy God with all your heart. Do you know divided loyalty? Uh, divided loyalty is is. Spiritual adultery. Spiritual adultery. And there, there are folks in this room who say, Preacher, I'd never commit adultery on my wife. I'd never do that. And maybe you wouldn't. And that's great. Have you committed adultery on the Lord Jesus Christ? Have you allowed something to come in and take you away from Him? Something to drag you away. Have you lusted after something else that you knew was ungodly? Listen, that's spiritual adultery. We're we're supposed, uh, the Bible tells us in Proverbs 4.24, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. We've got to work hard to keep our heart. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, because that's where your actions, that's where your words, that's where your thoughts come from, so you must protect it. You must protect it. I'm preaching better than y'all, amen. Amen. The objectives of our love to protect it with all our heart. But not only that, with all our soul. He said, verse 30, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul. What do you mean by soul? Well, that means emotions. All all your emotions and all your feelings. That, That means you should love the Lord thy God with all your emotions, all your feelings. We ought to have a a fervent love for the Lord. If you've got a fervent love for the Lord, somebody's gonna be able to tell that about you. I can go around this room, I won't do it. But I can go around this room and tell you some of you's got a fervent love for University of Tennessee. Might be other things. You know, you know how I can tell that? Because you'll jump up and down and scream and holler to TV. You'll listen to it on the radio wherever you go. Might be the, with the local football, with the high school football team. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm shocked at how loud folks get at a football game and how quiet they are in church. Fervent love. It's hard to hide a fervent love. It's hard to hide. If you really love the Lord, listen, you're going to get excited every once in a while. Your love's going to overflow every once in a while. You mean to tell, I know I ain't the greatest preacher in the world. I understand that. But you mean to tell me that you've been sitting here for three, four, five years and you ain't never heard anything that moved you to the point where you'd go to the altar? I've read a lot of the Bible standing right here. God's Word doesn't do anything in your heart. You're not excited by God's Word. You're not stirred by God's Word. If you're not stirred, listen, I know sometimes we're preoccupied and we hear very little of what's said maybe at times. But in the course of weeks or months or years, if you fervently love God, He's going to do something in your heart. There's going to be times when you're overflowing. And you're not going to be able to contain yourself. You know, I firmly, and if you don't, you you need to check up. Something's not right if you don't feel that. You see, with all thy soul, with all thy heart, with all thy soul. And then he goes on to say, with all thy mind. With all thy mind. The more you learn about God, the more you must love him. I mentioned a minute ago, agape is a love of choice. When you learn how much God loves you and what God has done for you, he went all the way to Calvary's cross. He bore the sins of the whole world. There on that cross, the nails were nothing but the sin. Listen, the sin, it it was repulsive to him. 
But you know what? As perfect as he was, he is. And as holy as he is, was, he is willing to take my dirty sin. Amen. And he'd go to that cross and do something for me that I never could do. And now I can have life. And the more I learn about that, how can I not get excited every once in a while? How do people not know that? How do I not want to tell anybody that Jesus loves them that much? If he died for me, he died for you. If he saved me, he'll save you. You need to be saved. That's why we do these things. That's why we preach. That's why we sing. That's why we have a one. That's why we do reality checkpoint. You see, with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and with all thy strength, he says, this is the first commandment, with all thy strength. What's that mean, preacher? Well, it means with all thy ability, everything that God has given me, I love him with that. And I love him through that. Everything that he's given me, I use that. Let nothing distract you. Let nothing dampen you. Let nothing drag you down. But we allow things to drag us down. We allow things to discourage us and to get us downhearted. And before you know it, we look just like the rest of the lost world. We're just going through the rat race every day. I don't know how I'll ever make it. I don't know, bless God, if I'll get to the end of this week or not. But you've been given a victory. You already have the victory. You have already got it. I've read the end of the book. We've got something to be happy about. We've got something to shout about. And if you're involved in something today that would hinder you from shouting, if you're involved in something today that would hinder you from serving, you need to get rid of it. You need to get rid of it. For something in your life, taking a place of preeminence that's weighting you down, that's keeping you from serving God, You need to get rid of it. You need to love the Lord thy God. He says, with all thy heart, thy soul, and with all thy mind, with all thy strength, with everything you are and everything that you have, you love the Lord God. The Bible says in Hebrews in 12, it says, Wherefore, seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, lay us, lay us out every week. If there's something hindering you from Jesus, lay it down. Lay it down. If it's not helping you, come closer to him. It's probably hindering you. He said, Let us lay aside every weight. And the sin which does so easily beset us, And let us run with patience a race that is set before us. And he said, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Not because he loved to bear the cross. Not because he loved to have my sins born on his body. Because he was looking forward. He was looking forward. It says, despising the shame, And is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. He said, lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. Love the Lord God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, all thy mind, and all thy strength. Friend, you'll never make it. You'll You'll never be triumphant. If you don't love God unconditionally. And if you love God unconditionally, people's going to be able to see that in your life. What do people see when they look at you? Do they see Jesus? I'm not saying you got to come to church, jump up and down, jump the pews and holler hallelujah and amen. You may sit there and be quiet as a church mouse, get more out of the service than anybody I know. That's not what I'm trying to say. What I'm trying to say, we ought to know if you're close to the Lord. How's your relationship with Him today? Do you love Him with everything you got, with everything that you are, with everything that He's gave you? 